Well, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you for joining us today on So You Want to Be an Angel Investor. We have with us Sri Iyer and C.K. Simlani, who will open up our discussion today. Sri? Well, uh, this is our first series of webinars on angel investing. I'm Sri Iyer, the president of Ty Houston. And before I hand it over to C.K. and the hall, just wanted to say a couple words. One, uh, for those of you, we are the largest global network of entrepreneurs. We are on uh, uh, fostering entrepreneurship, mentoring, networking, and education. And uh, this fits well within our charter of activity. And uh, tonight, we have a bushel at Margiano's in Houston uh, at the corner of Post Oak and Timer. All of you are invited to that social. It'd be 30. And uh, um, in next month, we'll be kicking off our the funding forum process, solicit applications from startup companies and mentors, do workshops, and uh, generally provide mentoring and networking the uh, through n beginning of November, the actual funding for the university. So, Hall said, I'm going to hand it over to you and CK. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sri. CK, what thoughts do you have at this time? Yeah. Hey, good afternoon. Good afternoon, CK Samlani, and I wanted to welcome everybody to the first uh, inaugural on angel investing. This is in association with this Open Angel uh, Network uh, nonprofit. Uh, the series will consist of two tracks for people who want to live where the topics would cover the basics about angel investing. And the second track would be for current angel investors who want to identify opportunities in particular sectors where we go more specific details on a sector. The tip speakers would be uh, existing angel in some of whom would be um, die charter members. The event would be the first Thursday of every month from 2 to 3. Uh, one week later, the recording of the webinar will be available on the Thai Houston site for its uh, We also plan on having a person event, which will include with other angel investors. Uh, part of this webinar would be 30 to 45 minutes of presentation, and then followed by 10 to 15 minutes. The question will be typed on the screen in the question and the uh, presenter would answer them. After each webinar, we will send out a feedback uh, form, and we appreciate your participation, so we can make this series more valuable for all of you all. Uh, with that, I hand it over to the presenter for today and the founder of the Open Angel uh, Network, Hall Martin. Uh, thank you, CK. So as uh, CK and Shree said, I'm with the Texas Open Angel Network. It's a 501c3 nonprofit. That means there's no investing or pitching or deal flow going on in the group. It's purely educational. And you'll find these sessions to be purely educational as we go forward as we won't be presenting any deals. So with that, let's go ahead and kick off. Thank you guys for spending your afternoon with us. I want to talk about those who want to become an angel investor and talk about setting expectations of what you'll find out there as angel investors itself. So the first question that comes up is, what is an angel investor? And essentially, it's an individual who meets the accredited investor requirement that is seeking to make an investment into startup and mid-stage companies with the goal of making a return. Uh, the accredited investor requirements are set by the Security and Exchange Commission. And essentially, it basically says anybody with a net worth of $1 million, not counting the house they live in, is an accredited investor and can be an angel investor. There are other ways to do investing, such as through a fund or a family office, but mostly angel investors are individuals. The other key issue is that investors are putting money in with the expectation of a return. Yes, they do donations and they do charitable work, but that is separate from angel investing. Angel investing is looking for a return by investing in promising companies with the prospect of a payback uh, going forward. So the name angel came from the 1920s 
And back in the 1920s, those who were putting on Broadway plays found their investors and called their investors angel investors. And when the current angel investor scene became more prevalent, and this happened back in the early 1980s, a man named Hans Severin actually led the charge and promoted angel investing and private equity investing throughout the U.S. And he adopted the name Angels from the Broadway plays they did back in the 20s. And so today there are many technology clusters around the country. There's Silicon Valley, there's Silicon Alley, Silicon Hills, and many other areas where uh, technology entrepreneurship is coming up. And so angels typically cluster in the areas where the deals are. To run an angel group, you need both investors with funding and you need entrepreneurs with deals. You need to have both in order to be an effective angel investor. And so angel investors gravitate to centers where there's a sufficient number of entrepreneurs uh, with new deals coming up. And also, there is money that has to be put into this. An angel investor typically invests anywhere from twenty-five to a hundred thousand dollars into a deal. Some invest more, uh, but most don't invest much less than that because to start a company requires two hundred fifty thousand, five hundred thousand, one million dollars. These are the deals that are normally coming into the angel groups, and so you have to be putting some money on the table in order to be moving the entrepreneur forward to their goal. So funding is a, a big issue and different deals require different amounts of funding and we'll talk more about that here in a moment. So essentially in angel investing, entrepreneurs are seeking funding and they are presenting their deals to angel investors who are looking at a variety of different deals and then selecting the ones that they feel there are the best fit for them. It is not unusual for an angel investor to look at 100 deals from which they choose 10 to do due diligence on and then they actually put money into only two or three. So if there are many, many deals you have to look at, that is very much the standard in angel investing is that you comb through many, many deals to find the ones that are worthy of your time and as you get further along with them, you'll spend more time with the deals you want to invest in. So many people have heard of venture capitalists and they've heard of family and friends money. And so where does angel investor fit between those? And the answer is, well, family and friends money are typically the first money that goes into a startup company, but, but it quickly runs out. Venture capitalists typically come in at the one, two, or three million dollar level. They're sometimes called vulture capitalists, but the angel investor is the one that bridges the gap between the two. After family and friends money runs out, maybe 50, 100, 200K have been invested into it, angels step in and they invest the next round of money that goes into it. Most angels or angel groups are investing anywhere in the 200,000 to $2 million range. They're in that category, so they fit between the family and friends category and the venture capitalists that are out there. So these are the groups that you often see out there. You've heard of venture capitalists. While there's not as many as there used to be out there, there's still later stage funding that will come along after the angel investor. So as an angel investor, you're growing a company to the next level and positioning it so that it can go further afield if it needs further funding that makes a big difference if you want to invest or if you don't want to invest. Some angel investors want to put the money in and have that be the only funding. Others recognize some companies are going to need far more money than angel investors can invest, and so they are putting money in with the thought that later stage funding will have to come along and add on top of what they are doing as well. So if we look at the range of the fundings that are out there and the time to close, what you'll find is that the family and friends money is typically the, the low end of the spectrum. It takes one to three months for family and friends money to decide to put something into a deal. And they're usually putting in zero to two or three hundred thousand dollars. And then you have individual angels. These are people that are making investments on their own that come in. And it's not unusual for the time to close to be a six month process or longer. And then there's the emergence of angel groups. Angel groups are putting in, are gathering the funds together from many individual angels in their organization, and they're able to actually invest more dollars, up to $2 million is an average number, 
uh, but their time to make a decision is going to be a little bit longer. That's in the six to nine month window because you have to bring many people together on uh, determining the terms, evaluation, and other aspects of the deal. And then in the rest of the curve, you see venture funds, strategic funds, family offices. There are other groups that will invest beyond the $2 million range. And of course, they have their own timetable to determine that as well. So who is an angel investor? Well, anybody that's an accredited investor is in a position to become an angel investor. And you'll find that there's a wide variety of different angels out there. And they have their own criteria. They have their own deal flow. They have their own reasons for investing. There's over 500,000 angel investors in the U.S. today. And you'll find that there's as many different kinds of angel investors as there are kinds of deals. And a great deal of the process is just matching the right deal with the right investor going forward. So when you look at the different angels that are out there, what you'll find is that some have a very high level of entrepreneurial experience. They've actually started and run their own company. And others have come from a different part of the corporate world, and so they may not have as much entrepreneurial experience. And then you also find a wide range of industry experience. You'll find investors that know your industry very well to people that know your industry not at all. And so those who don't know your industry very well and have not run their own company, we, we call that the financial return angel. And then those who have done actually um, a great deal of investments before and know uh, a lot about the uh, startup world, uh, you call those the guardian angel. And then in between you have the operational angel, those who have a great deal of experience but not much with the startup. And then you have what's called the professional angel, that those who are serial entrepreneurs or serial investors, and so they know the startup very, world very well, but they may not know specific industries beyond the ones that they've actually worked with. So you'll find that there's different kinds of angels depending upon what they're actually bringing to the table. So if we look at the spectrum of angels and investors around the country, you'll see that in the southwest region accounts for about 9% of the angels. And this is primarily looking at angel groups, formal angel groups that are out there. California has 21%, and the uh, New York, New England area has 14 to 16%. And so it varies greatly across the country as the number of angel investors are there. But what I can say is over the last 10 years, this number has grown dramatically. I was at the Angel Capital Association Summit six years ago, and that's the organization that uh, fosters angel group development. And there was about 150 group members there, and there was about representing about 150 different groups. Uh, today, six years later, seven years later, that group is now over 1,000 members in the summit, representing over a thousand groups. So it has grown uh, very fast in the last few years and people now come from all over the world, not just all over the USA. So if you look at angel investments, what you'll find is that they are very synergistic with venture capital investments. Angel investments, if we go back to some numbers we had from 2007, and this has moved up a little bit but not a great deal, is that angel investments uh, typically comprise the early stage investing and it tails off as they go to later stage deals. And that's because the amount of money deals want at a later stage gets to be uh, beyond what individual angels can put into it. In 2007, the number was at $26 billion. Today, that number is closer to $30 billion. And back then, it represented 57,000 deals, while VC or venture capital on the other side do very little early stage, but as you get to be later, they do much more. And venture capitalists is today just about on par with angel investment on a dollar per dollar basis, uh, although they're putting do larger dollar amounts into fewer deals. Angels in 2007 did 57,000 deals, and then today uh, venture capitalists did at the time less than 4,000 deals as well. 
the rule of thumb for angel investing is that 15% of the deals looking for angel investing will receive it. In the venture capital world, it's closer to 1% will receive it. So what type of investment could this be? There's different structures in which you can actually invest in a startup company. One is a straight loan. It's simply a debt. You put money in, they owe money back, and is tied to some collateral. There's also what's called convertible debt. And this is a debt instrument that has the promise of converting to an equity instrument down the road. And you'll often find deals coming in and they are not far enough along to uh, have an equity valuation discussion. They're at the very early stages. It's not clear what the company is worth. Uh, there's not a great deal of money coming in. And so what they'll do is sign up a convertible debt instrument because it's a very simple instrument. And it basically says, I'm going to put money in now. And then a year or two later, when we have an equity raise, I'm going to convert my debt into that equity. And I'm going to get it converted at a certain uh, discount to the other equity because I came in early with the convertible debt. And then the third structure is called equity in which valuation is set. We know how much the company is worth and ownership is set based on how many dollars the investors are putting in. And so it's straight up uh, ownership that's put into it. So those are three of the more common uh, tools that people use to put money into early stage companies. But the key to this is that, aside from loans, if you get into convertible debt and equity, is that it's very high risk. There's typically many more rounds of investment that will go on with an angel investment, and so you're subject to dilution. As more funding comes in, and quite often that's the standard plan to take on more funding, previous investors' ownership is going to be diluted down. And as long as people understand that and agree to that, well, then that's the plan for how it goes forward. So while you're getting a smaller piece of the pie, the pie should be growing bigger for everybody with the new investment that comes into it. And as we said before, angel investing is uh, very risky. And to just go and put money into one or two deals is going to be very challenging to hit a home run. A home run is any deal that's paying out 10x the money that you put into it. And if you see from this chart, if you only put uh, investments into one or two deals, the probability that you'll not get a 10x payout is very strong. It's over 80%. As you go to the third or the fourth or the fifth investment, uh, you see that probability starting to get better for the payoff. And when you get actually out to about 11 investments, then you're down to less than 15% uh, of not being able to get a payoff itself. And that's the challenge with angel investing is finding those winners because one out of 10 is going to be a very big winner and your challenge is finding that one out of 10. And the opportunity here is to invest in many deals uh, and to increase diversification in order to find that big payoff that comes out of there as well. So where does angel investing sit with other investments? Well, if you go out and look at the risk return curve, you'll find that there's real estate, there's treasury bills, and those, those are very low risk opportunities. As you go up the curve with stocks and bonds and futures and private equity, you'll find that the return gets higher, but so does the risk. And angel investing is out there at the end of the curve at one of the more risky places in the investing world. And that's because you have to find the winners, you have to put the money in, you have to structure it properly so that you gain, you don't lose too much through dilution and through follow-on fundings. And then, of course, the company must do well and grow in order to get there as well. So it's high risk, but it's also high return. So why do we do it? Well, but first of all, for those who choose the right deals, you can earn a very high return in a fairly short amount of time, two, three, four years in some cases, although some deals do take longer. Um, other angels do it because they want to keep up to date with business. They may have been successful with their current business, 
but new technologies and uh, new business models are coming to the market every day and they want to stay in touch with the business world and angel investing gives them the opportunity to keep up with promising companies and to learn about the new technologies that are coming on the market. The other one is angel investors want to give back to others. There is a certain sense of community that angel investors have that they want to share with others. And so at some level, angels want to invest in the community, and they look for deals that are part of that. Um, some angel investors have generated quite a bit of experience through their own businesses, and so they want to provide advice and mentoring to uh, future angels or to entrepreneurs coming up. So they want to be a part of a group and share what they have learned with other people. And next, they want to be active. They just simply want to get out and exercise and help solve problems and uh, keep active. And that's a great opportunity to do that here as well. And finally, uh, many angels do it because they want to meet new people and have fun. They have a saying in the angel world, an angel is someone who wants to make a little money, have a little fun, and do a little good. And if that's your interest, you may find that angel investing can be a, be a part of what you're doing going forward as it will help you do all three of those. So how much money could you invest or should you invest? Uh, many people ask me, should I write a $10,000 check? Should I invest $50,000? Should I invest $100,000? And the first answer we always bring back is you should not put any money into an angel investment that uh, would impact your lifestyle. Uh, this should be money that is purely discretionary, it's part of a bigger portfolio uh, asset allocation, and that is, if the money goes away, it doesn't impact the way you live at all, because there are risks in this, and the chance of you lose money is very prevalent here. So most investors have a portfolio where some amount is in what they live on, some amount is for retirement, some amount is for risk. And so you want to set aside a certain amount for risk and then decide how much you want to invest in each deal as it comes along. As we said before, the more deals you can get into, the greater your chance of having a hit and getting a good payout from it. The fewer deals that you're in, the harder it is to do that as well. So you should consider your situation and decide how much money you should be putting in in total, and then from there, how much you should put into individual uh, deals. And then the other question is, how, what type of company uh, could you invest in? The sectors you see on the screen there, health science, uh, software, hardware, consumer products, biotech, retail, services, these are the ones that we see most often coming in to seek angel investment. They have an information technology solution, they have a mobile app, they have social media, they have a low-end medical device, uh, they have an industrial product, they have a consumer product, and each of those uh, sectors have their own dynamics as to how to grow a business and how to exit it. And you need to look at the type of business that you want to invest in. Ideally, you're investing in sectors that you know something about. And you can actually bring more than just dollars to the table. You can bring expertise to the table. You can bring contacts in the industry or for helping close sales, helping bring partners to the table, etc. And so you want to look very carefully at the sectors and make a decision about which areas do you want to play in and keep up with. Because there is a wide number of sectors and a wide range of deals out there that you can look at. Next question I get asked a lot is, what kind of return on investment should I expect? And the answer is, it's going to vary greatly based on the kind of deal that you're investing in. There are some that are looking to get 3x their money after five years. Some are swinging for the fences, and they want to get 10x their money after five years. Others want something that's a little bit less risky. They want a two-year payback, and others want dividends. And so... The uh, type of company you're looking for is going to um, determine the uh, return that you get back from it. The more risky deals are going to give you a bigger payout, but you have a greater risk of getting there. You can invest in later stage deals, deals that are beyond just early stage or seed stage, those who are in the market, those who are growing well. You won't get as big a payback, but then you won't have as many companies uh, going out uh, a business uh, on your funds. And so 
something to consider is what do you want and expect from angel investing? You've set aside amount of money. You now know what you want to um, uh, get as a return on investment. And so next is you go out and you start looking for deals that fit that criteria. There are tens of thousands of deals out there. So almost any deal that you want to find can be found. The challenge is in finding it. So if you know what kind of deal you're looking for, what sector they're in, what kind of payout you want, and how much you want to invest, you're now in a better position to come in and start talking to entrepreneurs and looking at deals to see who matches what you're looking for. So there are several things that you should learn before you go after angel investing. Number one is how to evaluate an investment proposal. Uh, inve entrepreneurs are going to come in with one-page executive summaries, in some cases business plans, other cases nothing more than a PowerPoint presentation, and you need to be able to look at that industry, that company, and that team and try to figure out what is the um, opportunity that is here. And the, you need to be able to look and read a financial statement. You need to be able to look at a capitalization table. That is simply who owns what in a company. And what you're looking for is to see who is already in the business, who is already helping the business, and who is incentivized to work on this business based on their ownership that's in the company as well. So understanding financials and startup businesses is going to be key to making good decisions here. The next is you'll be doing a great deal of due diligence. Due diligence is the time you spend on investigating the details of the deal. And the first thing you should investigate is the team. You need to find out about the team's past experience, where they've worked, what they've done. And uh, next is you should look at the history of the company. Who is a previous investor? Who is a current investor? What has the company done in the past? What contracts do they have? What obligations do they have? You should be looking at their financial statements. What kind of debt do they have? What kind of uh, uh, promissory notes do they have out there? As well as the rest of their financial structure. And in particular, the cash flow. How much money do they have in the bank? How long, how much operating time do they have before they uh, need to raise more funding? Are all key questions that go into due diligence. Uh, the next thing is determining a fair valuation. This is a key issue in that a valuation is how much the company is worth before investment dollars go in. It's what's called the pre-money valuation. After you add the investment into it, the pre-money plus the investment is now what's called the post-money valuation. Well, setting the valuation becomes a key factor because that determines how much ownership the investor is going to get for the money they put in the entrepreneur is incentivized to keep that valuation as high as they can so that they can keep as much ownership of the company as they can. The, the investor, on the other hand, is incentivized to have that valuation as low as possible so that they get a bigger piece of the pie for the money that they put in. At the end of the day, valuation is a negotiation with entrepreneurs. It's not so much a formula. Yes, there's different uh, formulas out there, but what you'll find is that uh, it's a negotiation that the investor has with the entrepreneur. Uh, in addition to valuation, there's terms and conditions that will come in the form of a term sheet that investors will sign up with the entrepreneur. And this states who owns what, who controls what, and then who decides what is the basic uh, conditions of a term sheet. And for every risk you find in a deal, you can find a term to put into the term sheet to help mitigate the risk. It will never take the risk away completely, but what you may want to do is figure out for a deal that you want to do, and you've got a fair valuation, and you've done your due diligence, is to list what risks are in the, the business, and then go negotiate a term in the term sheets to help mitigate that risk. There's over 125 terms in the standard uh, uh, term sheet out there, and not all 125 are going to be key to your deal, but what you want to do is look at the risk and choose the terms that will help mitigate those risks in order to negotiate it out. Uh, next is setting expectations. If the company is expecting to grow at a certain rate, 
if the investors are expected to contribute a certain amount, you need to go in and understand what the expectations are and set the expectations with the entrepreneur with what the investor is planning to do. In many deals, investors will take the money they want to invest in the company and they will divide it into two halves. And they will put the first half in at the beginning and they'll keep the second half for later. Because most companies, 12 to 18 months, sometimes 24 months down the road, will come back to ask for more money. And if you've set aside some money for that second ask, you can then put that on the table at that point. The next one is, is in participating in the growth of the, of the business. Oftentimes, investors are asked to come sit on boards as board of directors or as board of advisors or as uh, additional support for the company. And if that's of interest to you, there may be an opportunity for you to be a part of a growing company as coming in through the investor uh, door as well. And there's many other things to learn, but in an introductory section, let's focus on those there first. And then um, let's look on now for any questions you may have. If uh, I go to the question box, there's a box on the screen. It says questions. So let's bring that up and see what questions you guys have as well. And go ahead and type those in, and let's see where we go from there. So the first question is, is how much do most angel investors invest in the deal? And the answer is most investors are writing checks of twenty to $50,000. Uh, sometimes angels will write 75, 100K checks, sometimes they'll write 10K checks, but most investors today are putting twenty-five to $50,000 into a deal. Next question is, how many deals do most angels do in one year? Uh, most angels I know are doing about one deal a year, sometimes two, but they don't do much more than that uh, because of the amount of due diligence that goes into it. If you're doing more than one or two deals a year, you need to make sure that you're doing the proper work on each deal, unless, of course, you're following on, and that's a common uh, opportunity is to let other people do the due diligence. But remember, in the angel world, everyone is responsible for their own due diligence. No one can do your due diligence for you. They may share additional information, but in the end, you are responsible for your due diligence, and you should do that to make sure that you have a good one as well. Uh, next one is, can you provide a link to where the standard 125 terms for term sheets are? That comes from the National Venture Capital Association, the NVCA. And I can send that out in the follow-up. We will record this presentation. We will send this to everybody. And I can re put a link for the NVCA in there. And the National Venture Capital Association, while they support the venture capital community, has come out with a set of documents that they consider to be current model documents for term sheets. And they've got a list of all the terms with definitions on their website that you can go to look up the different terms that are out there. And we'll include, the, include that in our follow-up email to the group as well. Uh, your line cut out when you mentioned the minimum requirement of net worth. Sorry about that. I understand there's a audio quality here. But essentially, you need to have $1 million of net worth, not counting your house, to be considered an accredited investor. And so $1 million, that incidentally was set back in 1968 and was changed only once about four years ago when the Frank Dodd Act came out to head off Bernie Madoff schemes. And they made one change to that $1 million requirement. And it basically said you can no longer count your primary residence in that calculation. So essentially, these rules have been around for almost 40 years. Uh, next is, will you be discussing the various valuation methods? Uh, yes, we can talk about valuation here briefly. I have my rule for valuation, which I'll be glad to share with you in this call. And the idea behind valuation is you want to determine what is a fair value for a company. But traditional valuation methods, book value, discounted cash flows, asset values, those don't apply very well to early stage companies because they're not far enough along to have enough data to determine that. So when I look at a company, I ask myself for, uh, I, give, I give them $1 million of valuation for each of four things. The four things are products, 
the second is the team, the third is the intellectual property, and the fourth is customers and revenue. So if they have a fully featured product that has uh, all the bugs worked out and it's working great, they get $1 million of pre-money valuation for that. If, on the other hand, they've got a beta version, it's buggy, it doesn't have all the features, they would get something less, say maybe $500,000. Under the team, if they've got all the major team players in place, everyone is a seasoned, experienced person working very well together, they get a million dollars for that as well. If they have only half a team, well, then maybe they only get 500000 The third one is the intellectual property. If all the patents and trademarks and copyrights have been filed and issued, they get $1 million for that. If they've got a few provisional patents filed but nothing has been signed off or provisioned yet, then maybe they only get $200,000 for that. It's something that you have to determine how much is there of, uh, for each of those elements. And, and the fourth one, of course, is revenue. If you're selling to 10 Fortune 500 companies with long-term contracts, well, you get a million dollars for that. If you only have five alpha customers that are paying a discounted fee, you would get somewhat less. And what you do in valuation is you go back and add up each of those values for the customer, the product, the team, and the intellectual property, and that gives you a ballpark. As you may guess, there's no way to get beyond $4 million of valuation in that equation, and that's by design. Uh, early stage companies should not be valued more than $4 million. If they can be valued with more than $4 million, they should be using discounted cash flow, book value, or the other traditional methods for doing that. So that's how we do valuation. If you would like to uh, have further discussions, by all means, reply back to my email I'll send out, and I'll be glad to tell you more about that. You probably answered this. Can angels invest in any stage of the company, or do they generally invest only during the initial stages? Uh, in short, angels invest in early stages of the company, and that's because um, in later stages of the company, most companies can find other forms of investment that don't pay as much of a return. So if a company has uh, $10 million of revenue and they, they've been in business for 10 years, they, they will probably most likely go out and get a loan because the cost of paying that loan back will be much less than getting money from an angel investor. And so most angel investors go to earlier stage deals in order to get uh, better returns. Yes, you can invest in mid-stage companies, but you'll find that the returns are going to be much less, and if they fall below a certain threshold, it may or may not be worth the risk that you're taking with it. The next question is, how do you value a pre-revenue company? What if the competitors are private and the revenues are not available? And as we were discussing a moment ago, you give yourself as a company four $1 million increments for the product, the team, the uh, the intellectual property and the revenue, those are things you know, you know what's there. It's not based on the competition, it's simply what uh, you see as values you built into the business and then you add those up and that's the proposed valuation. Then what some investors will do is they will simply go through and uh, reduce the valuation for additional risk they see or increase the valuation for having, uh, you know, uh, better opportunities there with maybe key customers or strategic partners or additional information that, may, that says this is going to be a better deal than the other ones as well. So what other questions do you have at this point? We have just a few more moments and just want to make sure we answer those. As I said, we will go through and uh, send you guys the copy of the slides and a copy of the recording that will be on the web and then I'll put the National Venture Capital Association in there so you can see where they are as well. So we have, uh, this is basically near the end of the slides so let's see what other questions we have and then we'll go ahead and wrap it up here in a few minutes. Um, the next question is what about investing in a fund? There, there are some angel groups that have funds out there, so you can participate in early stage deals or angel level deals 
through funds that are specific to angel investors. Uh, and we can give you a list of those if you're of interest to learn more about the funds that are available out there. Um, why would somebody invest in a fund? Okay. Um, so the idea behind a fund is that the investors put together a pool of money and then they set up a screening process. So as deals come in, uh, there's a screening committee that looks at the deals and accepts the ones that are going to meet the criteria of the fund and then they apply their due diligence and their process to it. So you can basically set up a criteria fund that goes through and uh, just finds deals that meet the criteria and if the criteria is met, the investment committee can decide if they want to deploy the funds. That's one way someone can do angel investing without having to go and search for all the deals themselves. The fund acts like a, a magnet that it, it attracts deals to it that helps increase deal flow and then once it's there, there's a, a process for deciding how to invest into it as well. Next question is, is where do I find the deals? Uh, deals can be found in many places. Thai has a funding forum that is uh, very popular. And there's many other groups out there that attract early stage companies, incubators, accelerators, business plan competitions. And uh, there's, there's quite a number of places where entrepreneurs are actively looking uh, for funding as well. And so we can give you a list of where you can find deals in and around the area also. Next question is, how much equity should an angel ask for in return for an investment? Uh, are there any guidelines for this? Also on debt, what kind of interest rates should one ask for? So the equity goes back to that valuation question. And basically, uh, what you're trying to do when you're setting the valuation with that uh, four one million dollar equation we had, one million for the product, one million for the team, one million for the IP, and one million for the uh, customers with revenue, you're basically uh, using that to determine the valuation. And when you have the valuation, then depending upon how much money you're putting in, that's going to determine how much equity you get. And so if we do a quick example here, let's say I have a company and my valuation, they get $4 million pre-money valuation and they're raising $1 million of investment. The pre-money is four, the post-money is the $4 million that, are, that they bring plus the $1 million investment equaling five as a post-money. The investor gets the investment divided by post-money. So the $1 million investment divided by the $5 million post money gives the investor basically 20% ownership. And so that's why setting the pre-money valuation is key because that plus the investment is going to give you post money valuation and your investment divided by post money is going to tell you how much equity you will own at the end of it. As far as debt goes, um, you, you have to look at the risk that's in the deal and the collateral that may or may not be there and determine uh, if that's a good deal for you. Many investors are, are not doing debt because there's so many other groups that are doing debt that it's very hard to get a good rate or a good return rate for the angel investor because the, uh, the pure debt of actually having someone owe you money um, it, it may be difficult to get a good return. Equity it can sometimes be a better better return. So deals seeking early stage investing very seldom have a pre-money evaluation in excess of $4 million regardless of the other intangibles, market size, competitive advantage, etc. And the answer is yes and the reason for that is most of the deals coming in looking for funding uh, have just brought a product to market, they, they just are starting to sell to customers, they're very early on, and if they have a, a long-term history of selling product to customers, then they, they usually have enough information that you can use a standard uh, valuation method such as discounted cash flows. We measure what kind of cash we expect to get out of it, we discount that back to the day, that's the valuation or they may have enough assets or equipment that give them a valuation as well. So we're trying to come up in this stage of, 
of investing with a valuation method that's not covered by the other methods. And when they're just going to market and just uh, selling their product and just building their team, then they typically don't have enough in there to make the rest of it work as far as they don't have enough to use these other valuation methods that are out there. And $4 million, you'll find that when the valuation gets beyond $4 million, it becomes increasingly more difficult to get angel investors interested in the deal. Uh, will you take a poll on what topics the uh, people want to see in upcoming webinars. So yes, we're going to send out a questionnaire and a survey and invite you guys to tell us more about what future topics you would like to see. We can talk more about the process of angel investing, finding deals, setting valuation, uh, performing due diligence. And we can also talk more about the uh, different sectors how to invest in the healthcare industry, how to invest in consumer product goods, how to invest in restaurant deals. And so we have both opportunities on the table, and we'll look forward to your feedback on the surveys as to what's out there. So yes, we will run a poll. Uh, next question is, would investments from family offices fit the angel model or be more like a VC? And the family office is very interesting. They're, they're halfway between the angel and the VC. The family office, oftentimes, for those who are not familiar with it, a family office is a group set up to manage a family's uh, funds as well as their affairs. So a family office will manage their portfolio for investing it, and then they will also manage uh, other assets of, uh, of a wealthy family itself. And what I find with family offices is that they're, more and more they are coming into the angel rooms wanting to do deals directly. They don't want to invest in a venture capital fund. They want to invest in the deal directly because they think they'll get a better return. In the family office world, they're, they're much more concerned about who else is in the deal and uh, what are the, who are the other players. What you'll find with angel investors is that they have uh, come one, come all, the more the merrier. You know, the more people in there putting in uh, 50K checks, the bigger the pool can be. And of course, both have pros and cons, but, you'll, but we are seeing more family offices coming in and working like angel investors putting money in. And some do bring a long-term history of investing in companies, and they bring venture capital-like experience to the table, and some will have more sophisticated due diligence processes in order to figure out if a deal is good or not. So I guess the answer to the question is, are they like an angel or like VC is, yes, in some cases they're like angels. They want to do deals on their own. And in some cases they're like VCs, and they bring professional money management experience to the table. So how do you find family offices? Uh, there are websites out there that uh, provide directories of family offices. And if you Google that, you'll find them uh, pretty quickly. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about convertible debt versus equity? So the difference between convertible debt and equity is that equity is setting the valuation. Ownership is fixed at the time the contract is signed. So if someone is coming in with a Series A equity deal, there, there's going to be a discussion about valuation. It's going to be set. Uh, funds are going to be collected. And ownership, by the time that document is signed, is going to be fixed. So ownership is fixed. Convertible debt comes in and says, we're not ready to have the valuation discussion. Let's call this a debt investment. The money is there, and but we're going to convert that debt into equity, typically one to two years later, when we have that valuation uh, negotiation. And the reason for that is, is that in the very, very early stages, if you apply our rule of four there, a million dollars for each of four things, you 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 know, the earlier the company is, the, the, the lower their valuation is, and they want to move out to the future that discussion. They don't want to have that valuation set today. They want that valuation set a year from now. But they need the funds today, and so there's a, a legal structure called the convertible debt term sheet. It's a very simple one. Typically, it's one to two pages. It's a very simple contract, not a lot of detail to it. It doesn't set... Uh, all the all the other terms that an equity term sheet sets, but it does give 
a certain right to have an ownership in the company, but the amount of ownership is not set until the equity uh, raise is made uh, later, at which point valuation is set. So we can talk more about that offline if you have any questions about it. Uh, are there any other questions at this point before we wrap up today's presentation? Uh, we had quite a few questions. Thank you guys for asking such good questions. We will take a survey. We will send you a recording of the slides that are out there. And we will go ahead and uh, wrap up the presentation today. Uh, we're just a few minutes shy of uh, our closing time here. Uh, so, as we said before, at the Texas Open Angel Network, we offer education on angel investing. There's no pitching, deal flow, or investing. It's purely education. We have sessions that cover just the life cycle of angel investing, and as well as the different sectors of angel investing. And we're glad to share more of that information with you in futures. Please fill out the surveys and send them back to us when we send them out later. And we'll send you the recording with the link to the National Venture Capital Association so you can get access to those documents as well. Thank you so much. And with that, we'll go ahead and wrap up today's session and look forward to seeing you at ne next month's session as well. Thanks so much.